Hey, what's up Seekers? Welcome back. If you're a religious person, perfectly satisfied with the story of Jewish mysticism that you've been told, and don't feel the need to question it, I highly recommend you not watch this series. Not to be dramatic about it or anything, but it may rock the boat a little and only be beneficial in ways that may not be immediately obvious or apparent further down the line. I mean that genuinely. If that description fits you, please don't watch this. Okay, for those of you that have decided to continue, welcome to our series on Neoplatonism and Kabbalah. This series is a very special one, both because the subject is one which is close to my heart, and also because I have the great fortune of creating the series in collaboration with some wonderful scholars and friends of mine here creating content on religious studies together on YouTube. This series is being produced in collaboration with Dr. Justin Sledge from the channel Esoterica, where he'll be looking at the relationship between Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. Philip Holm from the channel Let's Talk Religion will be looking at Neoplatonism and its relationship to Islam and Sufism. Dr. Angela Puka from Angela's Symposium will be looking at Neoplatonism and its relationship to Renaissance magic. Dan Attrell from The Modern Hermeticist will be looking at the Platonic Philosopher's Creed by the Neoplatonist Thomas Taylor. And last but not least, my friend Professor John Verveke will be looking at Neoplatonism and its relationship to cognitive science over at his channel, John Verveke. I hope that you head over and enjoy each of their videos and that together you come up with a much fuller picture of Neoplatonism and the role that it played in Western history from the beginning all the way until today. Please do go over, check out their fantastic content, subscribe to their wonderful channels, and now, onto the series. Where does Kabbalah come from? It's quite a great big mystery. For the traditionalists, the answer is rather simple. This mystical tradition of Judaism goes back to Moses, who received it at Sinai, perhaps even to Abraham, and even to Adam, the first man, back even to the beginning of time, and even earlier before time, to the primordial blueprint which God consulted before creation, before anything at all existed. There is truth, religious truth, to this tale, insofar as ideas embedded, incubated, inculcated, gesticulated and articulated within these traditions still speak truth to the perennially enduring questions within the human spirit and experience, providing relief and hope, balm and respite to a parched soul, mind and body, they can be said, these traditions and the wisdom they hold can be said to be eternal. This traditional tale contains, I think, a profound psychological truth, even if it's not entirely historically true. It helps, I think, to distinguish between religious truths and historical ones, between a synchronic and a diachronic analysis. To keep those distinct categories apart is important, lest we commit a basic category error. For today's purposes, however, we're going to be addressing the question from the historian's perspective, for whom this religious tale is not untrue, but is simply unfalsifiable. The historian must work in the narrow confines of time, texts, and literary evidence, producing a nuanced, qualified, temporalized picture drafted in the dusty libraries of history, not a cosmic narrative stretching back beyond time itself. This changing picture of the historian, formed and shaped within the crucible of time itself, will be the picture that we're going to attempt to paint and reconstruct over the course of this series. In time, we might endeavor to find the timeless, at that point where the two meet, where the timeless and timely unite. These classes take a tremendous amount of effort and time to produce, and I'd like to be able to continue making them for a while. If you find them to be enjoyable and educational, if you find them to be of value, both for yourself and perhaps for the world at large, 
please, if you can afford it, do consider supporting this work over at Patreon for as little as the price of a coffee a month. If you can't afford to support us financially, that's totally fine, I get it. But please do consider sharing the video and the channel with your friends and acquaintances. Word of mouth is an incredibly powerful tool, and with your help, we can really go places. Thank you. If you ask the historian of Jewish mysticism when Kabbalah emerged onto the historical scene, they'll find it a complex question to answer with any degree of precision or certainty. Firstly, unlike the traditionalist or general public, which uses Kabbalah as a catch-all term for all of Jewish mysticism, such as one might incorrectly use the term Sufism to refer to all of Islamic mysticism, the historian, in contrast, will want to be more careful and precise with their language. They'll want to distinguish Kabbalah from historical forms of Jewish mysticism which preceded it, such as the Merkava and Hechelot mysticism of the late Second Temple and Talmudic periods, the philosophical and ethical mysticism of Isaac Israeli, Ibn Gabriel, Ibn Ezra, Judah Halevi, Bachir Ibn Pekude, and Moses Maimonides, or the Jewish pietical movement of Germany in the 12th century and Egypt in the 13th century, or from the mystical traditions that follow after Kabbalah historically speaking, be it the heretical messianic movements of Sabbatianism and Frankism, or the popular 18th century Eastern European revivalistic movement of Hasidism. These are all forms of Jewish mysticism that according to the historian are something other than Kabbalah, and using Kabbalah to describe all of them is to do injustice to the historical diversity and particularity of each of these movements which deserve their own names and analysis. Some scholars may even object to the viability of the category of Kabbalah at all, pointing out that the rich diversity of individuals, schools, and movements that fall under this general umbrella of Kabbalah, things like the Iyun Circle, the Gironese, Castilian, Provincial Schools, the Abulafian Aesthetics, the Zoharic Poets, the Spanish Visionaries and Prophets, the Galilean Theosophists, the Lurianic Mythologists, and the Italian Philosophers that are all called Kabbalists, often have a lot more different than they have in common with one another, and that applying one label to all of them, homogenizing a diverse group of thinkers, containing vast differences of opinion and variety of conceptions, flattens them all under one term in a way that's not particularly helpful or useful and can often just be misleading. While this more critical, perhaps even deconstructive position bringing out the difference and differentiation may be true and even helpful on occasion when the research requires that degree of zoomed-in resolution and specificity, for present purposes we're going to take a middle ground on the question of Kabbalah, choosing to use the category indeed, but restricting it to the speculative trend in Jewish thought, which following the consensus of modern historians, emerged onto the historical scene in 12th century Provence, southern France, and a little later across in Castile and Catalonia, northern Spain. We will use the term and that is how we will be using it, not including all of Jewish mysticism and not discounting it because of the genuine diversity within Kabbalah, but we will be using it as such. With that little introduction in place, the question is, why did this innovative, imaginative, speculative, esoteric trend, which we now call Kabbalah, which would go on to really take the Jewish world by storm, entering mainstream Jewish thought and practice, even becoming the default orthodoxy and orthopraxy for large swaths of Judaism over the ages, why did it emerge onto the scene at the moment that it did? What were the historical factors that brought it out onto the stage of history? Was there, as the traditionalists claim, a secret mystical tradition percolating in subterranean channels of the Jewish world, privy only to a select few, to the handful of initiates in each generation, faithfully and clandestinely passing on the secrets of creation for hundreds of years, from the time of Moses through the judges, kings and prophets, priests and sages, in coveted secrecy, right into the Middle Ages, where it burst upon the scene in full color, poetry and prose, practice and persuasion. And if so, why? Why then, and why in the form that it did? How does its seemingly sudden appearance relate to the movements and schools of thought, the genres and bodies of literature that precede it historically, both within Judaism itself and within its broader cultural historical context?
The modern critical study of Kabbalah set out to answer just these questions. Some early attempts were made by the German Wissenschaft scholars, like Goretz, Goodman, Gaster, Jelinek, and Frank, but they were by and large hopelessly biased against mysticism as a phenomena in what they saw as otherwise a very proudly rational version of German Judaism which they were attempting to construct, and they gave some rather poor answers to these really pressing historical questions. Things got a little better when the German-turned-Israeli scholar Gershon Scholem got on the case and set the field of Kabbalah research firmly on its feet, with painstaking years of fine research unearthing hundreds, even thousands of manuscripts previously untouched and unknown by historians, digging up the very wells and channels that would go on to irrigate generations of scholars to come, planting and reaping in what would become one of the most fertile fields of religious studies of the century. Lining up with auspicious timing with the rise in the general public interest in mysticism from the 60s and onwards. On the question of the origins and emergence of Kabbalah in the Middle Ages, Shalom proposed that it was the result of the intermingling of two different forces, two different traditions, Neoplatonism and Gnosticism, or actually to be a bit more specific, what he calls Neoplatonism and Jewish Gnosticism, that, according to Shalom, accounts for the rise of Kabbalah in the 12th century. According to Shalom, it is these two traditions coming together, interacting within the intellectual elite of Judaism in the 12th century, that gives birth to our own form of mysticism, which we call Kabbalah. We're going to put aside the Gnostic side of this equation for the moment, and focus here on the Neoplatonic. Very briefly, for those that would like a reminder, Neoplatonism is an umbrella term given to the final stage of ancient Greek philosophy. It refers to a way that Plato was interpreted, which in its interpretation synthesized hundreds of years of the best of Greek thought, including Aristotle's psychology, Stoicism's ethics, and Neopythagorean numerical mysticism. Neoplatonism, perhaps the most influential yet least known philosophical tradition in the West, finds its first full expression in the Enneads of Plotinus in the 3rd century of the Common Era, and continued on in his students Porphyry, Iamblichus, Proclus, and others. Neoplatonism, via its Arabic and Latin translations, went on in the Middle Ages to have enduring influence upon Muslim, Christian, and Jewish intellectuals, fostering a common conceptual vocabulary and philosophical aesthetic for the mystics, rationalists, and empiricists, Jews, Muslims, and Christians alike, which, following the Middle Ages, continues to deeply impact Western philosophical thinking from the Renaissance in the 15th century to the Cambridge Platonists in the 17th, the German idealists, and the New England transcendentalists in the 18th and 19th, right up into the 20th century with philosophers like William James, Simone Weil, and Alfred North Whitehead, all drinking deeply from the wells of Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism is not just a philosophical system, but it is a form of philosophical mysticism. Its mysticism consists, in a word, of an attempt to reconcile the existence of the one, true existence, the infinite, the eternal, the absolute unity, what we might call God, with the many, the transient, the finite, the contingent, the composite, namely, reality as it appears to our limited senses. Neoplatonism does this work of reconciling the two with an elaborate, dynamic, and elegant description of the process of reality itself, which it sees in its totality as emanating and radiating from the One through a series of stages, a great chain of being resulting in reality as we perceive it. And Neoplatonism opens the possibility, which is the ultimate aim for the Neoplatonist, for the individual to make their way back up the chain of being, back to their true source, the One. Gershon Shalom, it seems, believed that Jewish ideas that had emerged around the turn of the Common Era in an internal Gnostic revolt against anti-mythical Judaism had been passed down secretly for generations, re-emerging only when they met the catalyst of Jewish Neoplatonism in 12th century Provence. The medieval marriage of these two ancient traditions, Gnostic mythology and Neoplatonic philosophy, on the fertile Jewish minds of Spain and France is, in Shalom's opinion, what gave birth to Kabbalah as we know it. 
This hypothesis, like many of Sean's in the field, became gospel amongst his students, many who would go on to become the leading scholars in the field that he had set up and plowed. And there it is, the secret is solved, Neoplatonism meets Gnosticism, bada bing bada bang, Kabbalah, story is done, thanks for watching. But things aren't so simple. Following Shalom, along came another scholar, who, like Shalom, cared less about the theories turned facts of the scholars that had preceded him, and more about the manuscripts themselves and what they had to say. Born in Romania, making his way to Israel when he was just 16, Moshe Idel read Shalom's work and was like, whoa, 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 hold on, not so fast. Things are a lot more complicated than that. Idel saw Shalom's origin hypothesis of Gnosticism and Neoplatonism lying at the roots of Kabbalah as one which sought to explain Kabbalah's roots as belonging to non-Jewish intellectual universes. Idel accuses Shalom of failing to look for an explanation for the emergence of Kabbalah from within internal Jewish sources themselves first. A development of a tradition within a tradition built on the interpretation of earlier Jewish texts and ideas, as Judaism does, the natural first place to look in Idel's opinion. Shalom, according to Idel, goes instead to find Kabbalah's predecessors in religious categories comparatively alien in the literature of classical Judaism, ignoring or at least not paying adequate attention to Kabbalah's natural habitat, Judaism. Where Shalom saw novelty, innovation, and infiltration from outside and marginalized sources, Idel thought it more natural to trace Kabbalah's development from within the world of Rabbinic Judaism itself, as an innovative, no doubt, but natural progression from earlier strata of Jewish thought. The literature of the Tanakh, the Talmud, and the Midrash the mystical texts of the Hechalot, Jewish poetry and philosophy, Piyot and Chakira, and lastly, the German pietical literature of the Hasidic Ashkenaz, the German pietists of the 11th and 12th century that we mentioned earlier. In addition to this accusation of prioritizing external sources, Idel finds Shalom's explanation to be too simplistic for phenomena as diverse as Kabbalah. Its literature, writes Idel, is replete with tensions, controversies, and fierce disputes, and any simplistic explanation of its origin relies on a smoothed-over, homogeneous version of this mystical literature, ignoring the variety of types of Kabbalah, differing from each other, both from phenomenological, historical, geographical, and terminological points of view, differing from each other in their experience, their time in history, their location in space, and in the language which they use to explain their theories. Idel, in his counter-theory for the emergence of Kabbalah, does not propose one simple explanation, one fit-all answer, or even one model of the relationship between Kabbalah and Neoplatonism, as if each of those were unitary, solitary, internally consistent things. Idel instead gives us a piecemeal answer, talking about the relationship of a handful of early Kabbalistic thinkers in relation to certain late Platonistic thinkers, followed by examining the next cluster of Kabbalists separated by time, geography, and belief from those preceding them, and so on and so forth throughout the history of Kabbalah, beginning from the late 12th century on the west coast of the European continent, all the way into the 16th and 17th centuries on the other side of the continent in Italy, Greece, and the Galilee. Idel believes that to understand the role Neoplatonism plays in the history of Jewish mysticism, one needs to first trace the rising and falling fortunes of Plato and Aristotle, or really Plato versus Aristotle, in their reception in Jewish intellectual history as a whole. Because when we read the Kabbalists closely, we can see them reflecting those general trends in their own relationships to these key thinkers and the schools of thought which they produced. While Neoplatonism had been on the rise in Judaism, with thinkers like Isaac Israeli, Solomon ibn Gabriel, Moses and Abraham ibn Ezra, and Abraham ibn Chia, with the rise of Abraham ibn Dawud, and even more so with Moses Maimonides, neo aristotelianism had become all the rage. One can, with a fair degree of precision, trace all of Jewish medieval philosophy as a battleground where Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism 
vied for supremacy, watching Jewish philosophy swing back and forth between them as their fortunes rise and fall. According to Edel, Maimonides' project, with its thorough rejection of many sacred texts, practices, and traditions of Jewish mysticism, forced the early Kabbalists to come out of hiding and counter his philosophy, which was spreading like wildfire, with a mystical philosophy of their own, a philosophy which they believed to be the true inheritance of the Jewish mystical tradition and esoteric law, the very one of which Maimonides was denying its legitimacy and authenticity. This Kabbalistic counterstrike to Maimonides, and the rejection of his Neo-Aristotelianism as well, which many of them believe to be the true illegitimate foreign intrusion into Jewish thought, is what gave rise, in Adele's opinion, to Kabbalah as we know it today, providing a alternative to Maimonides' thinking, a theory which gives us, ironically, Maimonides the great rationalist as the catalyst, albeit negative catalyst, of Kabbalah. According to this theory put forth by Edel, the resurgence of Kabbalah from a secret law forced to the surface in the 12th century by the unwitting hand of the great eagle did in fact mingle with Neoplatonic ideas that had already been made kosher by 300 years of Jewish Neoplatonists before it, which gave shape, in Edel's opinion, to early Kabbalah being a fountainhead of Neoplatonic concepts, imagery, and mystical turned mythical speculations. Join us next time as we explore a few of the key themes that make their way from the Neoplatonists into the early Kabbalists, and see what the Kabbalists themselves have to say about all this. Thank you everyone for joining us here to learn, thank you for those who made it all the way to the end of the video, thank you to our patrons who support this work over at patreon.com seekers, please do join them if you would like to and can afford it. And lastly, don't forget to check out our fantastic collaborators work making their parallel videos to this one on Neoplatonism and their own subjects of interest, Justin over at Esoterica, Philip Holm over at Let's Talk Religion, Angela at Angela Symposium, Dan at The Modern Hermeticist, and last but not least, John at John Verveke. Thank you for joining us, and as always, keep seeking.